Hello everyone and welcome to our session today, Accreditation 101 Acute Care. Our presenter is Nicole Nash-Arnold, who is a nursing career coach who helps great nurses transform into respected leaders. She shares her 15 years of experience in both, the, both senior and executive health leadership roles to germinate great leadership. Clinically, Nicole has over 10 years perioperative experience before moving into her nurse educator and management roles. She has postgraduate qualifications in perioperative nursing and currently a master's in nursing. Nicole is a member of the International Coaches Federation. Welcome to the microphone, Nicole. Thanks very much, Sue, for that. Today we're going to talk about um, accreditation and specifically accreditation in the acute care sector as it changes according to where in the health sector you're currently working. Um, but we're going to focus on the acute care sector today. And I think most of us who work in the acute sector are pretty familiar with the concept of the quality cycle, but very few of us who are working in the on the floor um, have really been very engaged with it. Um, it's certainly something that we often see when we are interviewed for any kind of position and that can be for anything when we, um, that we might be applying for in the hospital. So it might be something like um, an, an, a registered nurse, a graduate, um, not so much but sometimes but often um, a, level a senior clinical nurse role or an educator's role and as we climb the ranks out of the roles as well, we'll often find the interview question where the panel will ask something like this, can you tell us about a time when you've been involved in a quality improvement project? And certainly there are those when I've done interviewing and I've asked this question, about one in ten can execute that question very, very well and say, yes, I was involved in the quality improvement cycle when we rolled out um, the electronic medical record through the hospital and we started in this way and that way. But for the most of us, um, when I ask that, for the most nine remaining nine out of ten people will think that the question is asking them something to the tune of an electronic medical record rollout across a facility. And uh, usually they answer the, their answer to the question is no, I haven't. But the problem and the trick about this is that in fact we've all been involved in quality improvement cycles, we just didn't necessarily know it at the time. Um, so there have been plenty of things that you have been involved in that you just don't realise until hopefully today, which is what we're going to go through today, what does constitute quality and what does constitute um, just normal patient care. So if I give you an, an example um, of that, I interview, I was having a chat with someone who just recently been interviewed and answered that question and um, she, have you been involved in a quality improvement project and her answer was in the interview no. And I said to her after, but you know surely you've been involved in some sort of thing that you've done along your career, she was a 20 year exper very experienced nurse where you've seen a problem and you've done something about it. And she told me this story that her and her twin sister were both um, nurses, experienced nurses and they had um, both got jobs on an orthopaedic ward and they were doing a run of seven nights. First night, non-night duty, the bell rang from the time they arrived till the time they left in the morning. It was just constant nurse call and every time most of the nurse calls were on this orthopaedic ward is the patients needed to be toileted. They just couldn't believe the extensiveness of how much this bell rang all night. The second night Judy came along and the bell started again. So they actually went, this is ridiculous, and they counted the number of times that the nurse call buzzer went throughout the night and that it was relating to being patients being toileted. The third night there was no way that they were going to get done again, so they actually started an hour earlier, went around to the ward and toileted all of the patients before lights out and they tucked them up into bed and said goodnight to them. And they had a lovely night where they had read Woman's Day for the entire shift and they were delighted with themselves. When the 7 o'clock came on the, um, the fourth morning, they said to the nurse unit manager, here's the story of our four last four nights. We did this and we found that and we 
we've changed it and this is what we've done. And the nurse manager was absolutely delighted and rolled out a program in the ward where they actually toileted the patients and did a final ward round at nine o'clock at night before it was lights out and settled all the patients into bed. And as she told me that story, I said to her, that's accreditation. That's a quality improvement project. And she said to me, well, it's not really, you know, it's not, we didn't do this and we didn't do that. It wasn't a thing. It was just a little thing. And I said, no, no, that's exactly what accreditation is all about. It's not just a group of people coming through every two years and, you know, this nebulous thing that lives off into the, the sunset. Accreditation is about how we improve pa patient care. It's the accreditation cycle is just how we show it. But the projects and the improvements like that is what it's all about. So what we're going to go through today is a pretty standard format about how we go about the projects that make accreditation. So it's about the process of accreditation, but also what we do as nurses every single day on the floor that contribute to that accreditation cycle. So there's really a four-step process. Most people will use a five-step process, but in the interests of um, the majority, we'll talk about the four-step process. And that is what you can see here. Plan, do, check, act. Now, it might sound familiar to you. This is a business-based model that is rolled out across all industries. You can see it in engineering, you can see it in IT, you can see it in large-scale businesses, and you can see it in healthcare. But actually, it's the nursing process. It's assess, plan, implement, evaluate. It is absolutely no different. It's it's just rather than assess, plan, implement, evaluate on the one patient you've got in front of you, then we're actually more broadly looking at the process to deliver care to the patients. So if you are on the orthopaedic ward or you're in the operating theatre or you're in day of surgery admissions or whatever, what is the process that you use for this patient when there is a problem? So. The quality cycle seeks the opportunity for you to make something better. So the P for plan is what are you hoping to achieve? What's the desired result? And the do is the implement. You go off and, and you do that. Then you come back and you study the results of that change that you've made. So for as a result of your doing, have you reached what you hoped to when you planned to achieve that? and then you take action. Now that you're left with a new baseline, what does the ward look like now? What does the patient process look like now? What does the patient care look like now? Now that you've improved it, you've made a new baseline and you go back to the beginning and you go and you plan again. There's often an O that's included in there and I usually include the O which is precedes the plan and it's really observe that you really take a good look at your current situation. It's an environmental scan. Here we are. We've got a ward and we see we've got 30 beds in our orthopaedic ward and we have a problem and in that orthopaedic ward where the bell goes or not. So what do we plan to do about it? Well, well, we're going to see what we can do to reduce the bells. What do we do? Then we toilet the patients before we come and we check. Did it work? Woman's Day was really interesting. It was wonderful couple of hours. Then we come back and we act and we say to the nurse manager, yep, that worked. No bells. Patient slept. Heaps better. It's obviously going to be better for them that they can sleep. Then we've, and now we, we've got a new baseline. And then we come back and we observe and we go, yes, this is an improvement. Is there another opportunity to improve it in a more broad way? And you go from there. It's exactly in that same way. It's the same way that it's based in the um, research um, concept in that there's a hypothesis and experiment and evaluation. The difference here is that there is an action so, so that you can drive that cycle once again. So in terms of this um, presentation that I'm going to go through with you today, then I'm going to structure it in terms of those five principles that we observe, we plan, we, um, we do, we study, we act and chunk that information. As if you were a nurse and I hope that you are a nurse that's come to this presentation without much knowledge about what, accredita what this accreditation gig is all about. And so we will take a look at what it is and how you might get involved in it is if that was the quality improvement cycle. So one of the interesting things about the way in which um, 
quality can be more consumable for those of us that are not necessarily involved in every every day is that concept of storyboards in the similar way to the way movie producers prepare storyboards to tell the story about what they hope to achieve when they make a movie and store quality storyboards has started to become something that is quite prolific in the way in which you present the information because it increases the engagement and it's a pictorial way of delivering the key information to people that are needing that information and that might be your, the staff in the ward and it might be the key stakeholders like the visitors or the doctors or the allied health team or the broader multidisciplinary team and the patients themselves. So the storyboards are a really great way of depicting that information and that's also the way I've presented this material here so that you can get a sense of how you might be able to engage with this process a little more easily than a 50 page document that you have to trawl through. So my first storyboard. So you can see here the um, idea about this um, process is that accreditation can be something that is fairly nebulous and removed. And what we're going to talk about in the observe um, part of that is the accreditation process in how does this work and then we're going to go through how you make a process, a quality improvement pro project happen. But if we're going to observe the nature and the environment in which the accreditation occurs, then this is what we're going to have a look at in terms of who are accreditors and what do they do. So my first um, port of call is going to be talking about um, the fact that accreditation can sometimes feel a little bit like it's those in the ivory tower and that's that first left hand photo. Um, people in the ivory tower are sitting at desks that are generating projects and generating forms and generating policies and generating procedures without much connectivity to what actually happens on the floor. You're the ones that are actually looking after the patient in bed 17 with a lap collie. And, but what does the person that's sitting in the desk in the ivory tower feel about it? There's a major disconnect with that. And it's, there's often the wards that I've worked with and the nurses that I've spoken to feels that all accreditation is is a three month scramble before the surveyors turn up and then there's all of a sudden they find that the bins get changed and the posters come off the walls and then there's all of a sudden there's a new policy that gets sent out and there's a scramble for you to sign that off. And there's not a lot of engagement in terms of what all of this is about and it feels a little bit like policing that all of a sudden the creditors are the police that turn up after all of that time and they are the ones that are coming to scrutiny compliance and pouncing on non-compliance. But actually accreditation is vastly different from that and the surveying process is not necessarily a policing process. So at the top of the page um, on here then really it's about um, a, body, a group of people that are appointed by the federal and state governments and they're the Safety and Quality Commission. This body was formulated around 2006 as a COAG initiative and they're, they're, this particular federal body aims to be to lead and coordinate national improvements in healthcare. That's what this particular body is all about and they are overarching body for determining the standards for which hospitals and day procedures and the majority of public dental procedures must adhere to. They developed 10 standards that we must adhere to in, if we're working in the acute care sector. And they're responsible for developing those standards for all of those facilities, hospitals, day procedures and dental, major public dental facilities. They, their goal is to substantiate an health care, an acute health care sector that's sustainable and safe that delivers high quality outcomes. That's what that particular body is all about. Underneath that, then there is 10 standards, those 10 standards. And we'll talk about those a little bit later when we go through how you might execute a quality, act, quality activity underneath this umbrella of accreditation. But 
after years of this accreditation cycle has been going around for a while now, but these 10 standards are actually where the, f the federal and state government have actually finally got it right because they are quite tangible and they are quite relevant to what we do on every day. You can see when you're looking after patient in bed 17 and when they're day three after their total hip replacement, how these 10 standards are important to make sure that they have the best clinical journey that they can have. They are actually highly relevant and very sensitive to what that patient journey is about and making sure that we're delivering a high quality of care. But it's not just necessarily those 10 standards that we have to adhere to. There's actually, there are others, there are Australian standards, for example, in the operating theatre, then we must comply with the Australian standard 4187. Um, the colleges have, um, have dictate a whole range of criteria as well. The Australian College of the Anaesthetists set out a whole range of um, portfolio of standards about what must be met when you're delivering anaesthetics and sedation in any procedural environment. And the same with the state government have got a load of workplace health and safety standards, regulations, legislations that we must adhere to as well. But ultimately, it is these 10 standards plus the relevant other standards that we are assessed at being able to meet. These national standards are um, not administrated in terms of their compliance with that body. The Safety and Quality Commission aren't the ones that come out and say, are you meeting our 10 standards plus the state and federal standards that you must comply to? And it's a little bit like the Australian Tax Office. They're not the ones that are necessarily working out whether you've paid your taxes. And they're certainly not ta working out your tax refund. That's decentralised to tax accountants and auditors. And they set the rules and then other people audit that and they will do spot checks. And it's the same way in accreditation. The federal government set the 10 standards, but they're not the ones that do the survey to make sure that everybody is compliant. In fact, that is devolved and delegated to nine particular bodies in Australia. They're the Australian Quality and Safety Commission have authorised nine companies to come out to hospitals and survey them. And I think most of us will be familiar with one of those, which is ACHS, with the equipped standard. A lot of hospitals over the years, the last many decades, have been using ACHS um, to do their accreditation cycle. And they use the equip process to be able to measure hospitals' performance against those 10 standards. But they're not the only body that can measure. And there are a lot of hospitals now that are moving away from ACHS and using other organisations such as NADA or Global Mark or BSI is another one. Simply put, they're just bodies that are delegated, have the delegated responsibility to check compliance and survey hospitals. So when they do that, not all of them use the same process. Another, another part of the language that you might hear in this um, accreditation cycle is that they use um, not necessarily the equip process like ACHS do, but they use ISO, the ISO standard, as a methodology to check compliance. That's all that they're doing. The 10 standards are there and this is the way in which they check it. They use the equip way to check it or they might use the ISO. And the ISO is all about an international standard setting body. And it is called the International Organi Organisation for Standardisation. And they have a range of standards which they measure against. And in this particular case, when they come in and use at hospitals, the ISO standard they use is the 9001 which is the quality management system. And other bodies use that as well. It's really just the vehicle in how that they check that compliance. And the, but the overarching, most significant standard that the Australian federal government and state governments have decided that hospitals, day procedures and dental facilities must comply to are those 10 national standards. And that's when they 
hospitals have the opportunity to take those 10 national standards to the best that they can do, measure what they do, have a whole load of quality improvement activities, have a whole load of audits, and they have a look at what they do in relation to those 10, and then they do great things with it. It's just a measure of KPIs, and that's what the accreditation process is about, is that the surveyors come and measure and have a look at the key performance indicators that the hospital has measured over that two years and see how it ranks against those 10 standards. And there are lots of key performance indicators. A lot of them are financial, such as occupancy and work hours per patient day, how many the pharmacy dollars that one might, that the hospital might spend per patient, medical supplies, but there are also the clinical ones as well. So for example, door to analgesia time or door to antibiotic time, and door to needle time if you're in a cath lab, infection rates, your compliance with five moments of hand hygiene, returns to operating theatres, unplanned admissions to intensive care, readmits within 24 or 28 days, morbidity or mortality data and triage time amongst a plethora of others. But they're real genuine things that clinicians can get involved in over that two years or three years, depending on the cycle time for the organisation that it surveys the hospital. And they come and they look at, well, this is what you've done. How, what are your triage times like? What are your five moments of hand hygiene like? What processes do you have? So you've, you can demonstrate that. And unbe put unbelievably simply, when we observe the nature of our current situation, that's what accreditation is about, just simply that accreditors come and check up on our KPIs. But those KPIs are the things that have to be done. They're the ones, that's where all of the work is. And that's where the orthopaedic nurse who's realised that patients are calling out all night to go to the toilet because they needed to have been toileted earlier in the late shift, then they've improved an outcome for the patient. They're getting better rest, they're getting better care, their basic needs are being met, and they're having, they're, that's an improvement. That's a process. And the surveyors come along and go, wow, that's fantastic. That's one of the 10 national standards. It fits under this of the 10, and that's how you demonstrate that you're improving performance all of the time. That's, how, that's the observation of the current um, way in which we do accre the accreditation. But the rubber hits the road in the planning and the PDSA cycle. That's where you get to be involved so that you can generate those KPIs so that the surveyors come and have a look at them and go tick. And that's what we have a look at when we start to look at planning. So you just, planning is all about what do you need to do to deliver on those 10 standards. The quality storyboard that we'll go through next is really about how a quality project might be born what things you can do in your ward every single day when you look at it carefully that you think could be done better. And it's not the complex stuff like rolling out an electronic medical record facility-wide. That can, could be one, but the things that you're going to be, the, the, just the much simpler things that where nurses are going to be involved in, working out that there's something that's just not right at the moment. It's just not ideal. So, for example... Nurses are the best position to be sitting there in on the ward with the situational awareness to say, hey, execs, this isn't really working. And it, it usually comes about as a form of some sort of frustration. There is a problem in the ward. So, for example, you might be a nurse in charge and you work full-time on a medical ward and you do a lot of lates and weekends and you start to realise that at 8pm, every time you're in charge on a late shift, that you're phoning for linen all of the time, and that there are no blankets, there are no pillowcases, they're usually the main offenders, and pillows constantly start going missing. You don't think too much about it, but in the back of your mind, when you really start to think about that frustration, and then once again it's 8 o'clock that you're calling, you really start to get that sense of, this is really annoying, and that the patients are suffering because there's no, there's no blankets. You're having to waste valuable time instead of delivering patient care, running downstairs to the surgical ward next door to find more linen, to bring it upstairs, to give to the patients. And it's an absolute waste of time. It's completely inefficient. 
this may or may not be the point at which you ask yourself the ultimate question in that planning cycle is, are our targets being met? And so there are, it, is it an efficient reuse of your resources when you're on the ward, when you could be delivering patient care and you're wasting time? That's that planning phase. Are things working or not? What is it that you expect to happen? Is it reasonable to expect that the ward doesn't have linen after 8 p.m.? every single solitary day. I'm thinking most of the time you're going to think no and that things could be done better. But it isn't necessarily that that always prompts action. Sometimes it's a crisis or a sentinel event that prompts action. I'm not exactly sure what sentinel event might come, across, come out of having no linen, but nevertheless there might be some sort of other clinical scenario where you have taken an intake of new graduates. And for some reason, these group of graduates, uh, their aseptic technique isn't all that great. And you've noticed it when you have observed them doing a, um, a couple of dressings. You've noticed that the problem is a little systemic because it's not just the one graduate, it's actually a couple of them that are in the ward. But the crisis comes about when all of a sudden there's a major infection in one of the patient's wounds. And you think, there is a problem here in the ward at the moment with our aseptic technique. And now you can see that something has to be done about it. And you ask yourselves those same questions. Is this working? Is what we're doing the best that we can do? Is that what you expect? If your patient comes and has their total joint replacement with you and then on day three they start to get an infection because you know that the compliance with the aseptic technique is poor, is it reasonable to expect that, that a patient would, that would be a part of their journey in a skilled healthcare team? When you've planned that concept out and you look at it and you say no, then you have just created your first quality improvement project because it's not what you expect and now you've got to move on to that next phase about what are you going to do about it. That's the phase where you get on and fix it. It relies on a significant amount of work with the team and you ask the questions, you list the tasks that you think needs to happen to affect the change and you need to sell it to your team. It's important to engage everybody in that part that has a part to play because it's easy to make it just about the nurses, but actually that it will include the entire multiple disciplinary team, in, particularly in the case of our infections, where you may need to look at how the whole process, is it the way in which the doctors are coming to look at their patients post-operative surgical wounds, how is cleaning happening, what's happening with the way in which we're transferring patients. There are lots of questions to ask and it's not necessarily just about the way in which the nurses are doing it. Oops. So when we're doing a task and we're doing a process or a quality improvement activity, then we need to start to look at um, where those doing functions and those doing those projects are going to sit. And it's important just to take a minute to have a look at those 10 national standards about how we're going to facilitate um, each of those 10 national standards into those projects that we're doing every single day. So the 10 national standards, as I said earlier, are incredibly functional about what you do every single day. So the first one is about governance for safety for quality and healthcare organisations. Now that is actually really all about the senior organisation and how they implement policy and procedure and they communicate it. Not so relevant to the nurse on the floor that's looking after the patient in bed 17 with a lap collie. But certainly when we partner, and standard two is about partnering with consumers and it's about how in which we engage the consumer. There is a significant push in our industry now for us to involve the consumer about what they want, what do they expect, what do they think that when they come to an acute care facility should be happening. Um, there's a large, most organisations now have a consumer group 
which is much more than, yes, what we used to have with the focus groups in terms of getting feedback on how we delivered service. This is actually a group of consumers that represent all of the patients to say, yes, I think this would be a service that would be of value to this hospital. We expect you to be able to give us these this sorts of in, sorts of information when we're discharged. We don't expect to be laden with enormous numbers of forms. Everything that happens in a hospital is submitted to that group to say, what do you think? Standard three is healthcare associated um, infections. Obviously core cool business for the registered nurse who and enrolled nurse who is the um, patient advocate. How we deliver our care so that it is safe from in respect to infections is our absolute core business. Standard four is medication safety. Do we have processes in place in our ward so that when we give medications, it is always 100% safe? There are no medication areas. We're following the six rights that we have, have got our controlled drugs locked away, that they're safe, we've got processes. Standard five is patient identification and procedure matching. Clearly very significant, particularly for those in the procedural world. Are we doing the right procedure on the right patient? How, do we, how does the hospital demonstrate that? When you're standing in the operating theatre and you're about to cut open that total hip replacement, are you absolutely sure you're doing it on the right side? Standard six is clinical handover, one of the greatest risks of our time. I think that when I know everything about the patient because I've looked after them for eight hours, but I only give you 60% of, of the information when you're coming in to follow me at night duty, then that's a major problem. Chinese whispers, there's lots, loads of opportunities for issues to occur with a patient in clinical handover. Standard seven is blood and blood products. So are we delivering blood safely? Are our staff knowledgeable to recognise a reaction? How do we know how to go and collect the blood that we've got the right blood for the right patient? Standard eight is preventing and managing pressure areas. When our patients come to us, particularly the elderly and those with chronic disease, can we guarantee them, do our nursing staff know enough so that they're not going to get a pressure injury? The same with standard nine, recognising and responding to clinical deterioration. When a patient comes to us, that they trust that we will look after them and catch them when they fall. And that fall might be a clinical deterioration so that we can identify it early and reverse it. And finally, standard 10 is preventing falls and harm from falls. And again, if a patient comes to our facility and they are in bed 17 after their lap collie, do we know exactly what to do so that we can make sure that they don't fall in our facility? Those 10 standards is what the surveyors come and have a look at what you do. And they want evidence to see that you're doing it. And they're pretty core business for the nurse on the floor. So when you look at what you do and every single day when you've got your clinical load of your um, patients and if you've got in a medical ward and you've got a couple of oncology and an end stage um, respiratory patient, do you know for a fact that they are getting the best care in terms of their clinical deterioration? When you look at your team, do you know that all of your nurses can recognise deterioration when it starts at step one and they don't wait till step 10 before we catch it and reverse it? Do you absolutely know that everybody knows those oncology drugs so well that they're safe to be delivering them and they can recognise the signs of reaction and know the doses and are familiar with those drugs so that they can clinically administer them safely? Do you absolutely know that your elderly patient, when they're in with you, aren't going to get a pressure injury? And if you can look at that and you can observe and you know that with hand on heart that there's nothing further that this team of nurses could do, then your accreditation is going to be great. But if you look at it and you think, there's a couple of areas here where you think, oh, I know that we're a bit flawed in our knowledge across all of those oncology medications. And we've got a few junior staff members that really don't know much about neutropenia and wouldn't be able to recognise it. Then that's an opportunity for you to start doing. So you've observed it. What are you going to do about it? What, what, what's your theory? I mean, if when you're planning and you start thinking about, right, they don't know enough about neutropenia and that's going to be a problem for clinical deterioration, then this is your doing. 
that falls into that category of the doing. That's where your project is in terms of what will you do for determined clinical deterioration? I would be thinking in education that you would have a, some sort of competency that you'd follow up, that you'd make sure, you'd supervise. There are lots of strategies that you can roll out in the doing phase according to what it is that you're trying to achieve, but at one of they will fall into these 10 categories of doing. After that, then we need to start looking at what we're going to study. What are our numbers? How do we know we're achieving? We've worked out that there's a problem with the neutropenic patient and the knowledge base in our ward. We're going to roll out some education, a bit of supervision, going to have a competency, going to follow up, going to do a number of things. How are you going to measure it? That's where we come up with that phase of really this is the data collection and you present what's happened after you run your test. So we're going to go through a bit of an example about which is going to really focus mostly on the um, study part of the process. And in the particular, particular scenario, we found that problem. We've done an observation and we found a problem. So we're going to need to make some changes and we're going to need to find out what's happened and compared to what we had hoped would happen. So let's take an example of infections. You've done an observation and you've, you've had an intuitive feeling at this stage anecdotally that when you come on and you're in charge in the afternoon and over the course of time you've seen an increase in infections. So the, this medical surgical ward does what any med, good medical surgical ward does, which is they take a measurement. They're doing their five moments of hand hygiene. When they do that, they discover that 40% of the doctors are non-compliant with the five moments of hand hygiene, which is a considerable problem. So now they've worked out, they've done their observation, they've planned, and now they've studied and they've got some sort of data. That's what the study phase is all about, that they've observed, they've done, we're working in the standard of the infection control, avoiding infection control, hospital acquired infections, and now we've studied and we've pinpointed what we think the problem is, or we've pinpointed a problem. The power of the study phase is that now you have the data to go to people to be able to say, we've pinpointed what the problem is, now what do we do with it? What's your next port of call? That source of infection is, may have had a number of different factors, but at the moment you've found this one and that's what you need to do to act on. The ACT phase, which we'll go through in a moment, is really then you go to the doc in this particular situation, you've, you've identified that the doctors aren't compliant, then you go to the doctors and you're going to say to them, guys, here's our data. Doctors are generally data-driven people, they're generally logic-driven. You come in and you go, this is the evidence that we have, this is the study that we have done, this is the non-compliance that we've identified, we need, we've got an increase in infections in this ward. You get them on board and then you take action and then you evolve the process through that so that you can hopefully affect some sort of change and get those bugs under control so that when you go back to then continuing to do your five moments of hand hygiene, then you can see an improvement in that study. You can see that once, once you redo the audit, 40% of the doctors were non-compliant, now 90% of them are compliant and the infections. So you need to go back and have a look at what numbers is studying and compare before and after. That demonstrates the importance of the studying, how it drives your actions. But this is a cycle. And it's incredibly important to recognise that it is an ongoing process where it drives into the next phase. So in this particular situation with our infection, we've had, we've identified a problem in the study and we've acted on it. We've got the doctors on board, we've given them the data, we've corrected that issue, we've driven their compliance up to 90%. And now we observe again. Now we do the study again and we go, 
Right, so now we've got 90% compliance, what's our infection rate like? In this particular situation that we're going to work through in terms of action, we're going to talk about the fact that it, the infection rate didn't really change. The infections are still very, very high. So now you need to read, go through the process. Plan, is that what you expect? No, it's not. Patients are still coming into this ward and they're still having an operation, they're still getting an infection and that's not part of the process. That's not what you expect of them. So then you think, right, what are we going to do about it? Then you have to have a look at more broadly because obviously there is a darker enemy that lurks within for you at the moment. So you it wasn't the doctors. They'll be delighted to know. They're an easy shot. There's another problem. So you need to look more broadly about what processes, and, and maybe it's not just when you have a look at which patients are getting infections, it's not just the orthopaedic patients. If you look more broadly through the hospital, that might be one of your strategies. Is it just the orthopaedic patients that are getting infections, or is it the vascular patients? and it's the plastics patients, and it's the ENT patients, and it's the general and the gynae patients as well. Their infection rate's higher than what you think. So now you have to look at some hospital-wide problem. Once you do that, do that data and you do that study, then you've acted and you've engaged now the broader hospital and you've, your nurse manager is having meetings with the others and maybe they've found a problem in terms of that the processing through CSD is the problem. I correct that and then you study. You've made an action and then you study it again and you take a look at what exactly was the problem, you've corrected it and now you come back and you go, what's our infection rate? Our compliance with the five moments of hand hygiene is low and our infection rates have dropped considerably and you've closed that loop. Now you've got a new normal. So you've always got your new standard benchmark of 90% of doctors compliant and your infection rate is now has dropped down to X percent and now you go through the process again, you observe. What are our infections like? They're still like this. They're still at an acceptable level of compliance. They're still at an acceptable level of percentages. So now we're just going to monitor. But then later down the track when you continue that cycle, there may be another problem that blips up and you address it. That, in essence, is the way in which the process for accreditation works. But all of that work, the planning, the doing, the studying and the acting, comes from the people on the floor with situational awareness so that they can see what's happening in the ward and is it what you expect? And then you put into place a range of actions that you measure and you see that it's improved. That is the core business of what we do and it's certainly not a three-month scramble at the end so that we can remove the posters from the wall and make sure that the wipes are off the sink and we, we all of a sudden are popping up the soap on the wall so that they're mounted correctly. Accreditation is actually about what we are as registered nurses in terms of making sure that we're advocating for our patients because that's what where it's easy to when we advocate for our single patient, but this is taking that step of for all of our patients, all of our orthopaedic, all of our oncology patients or medical patients or gynae patients, are they getting what we expect that they should get? And if the answer is no, then you've created an area where you've got an opportunity to advocate for them and implement something that is improved. And at the end, you can improve that. And then the surveyors come at two years and you showcase, hopefully in the format of a storyboard so that it looks in a way in which people can consume it and engage with it. And you can see how you have gone from the last two years, we had a poor compliance with hand hygiene and an infection rate that was this. But the nurses identified it and they resolved the problem. And now our numbers look like this. And then we had a situation where the... Patients were calling all night and had disrupted sleep, which ultimately impacted their recovery rate. The nurses identified it, put in a strategy for ward rounding at nine o'clock every night, and we've got improved outcomes for it. In fact, we then rolled out ward rounding across the ward, and now our patients are toileted every two or three hours at the end of the shift. And the, that quality cycle just goes so that you're just getting better and better and better. And then the surveyors come and take a look at how you're doing and make sure that those 
each of those 10 standards that you've ticked the boxes. If you want some more help, I've got a whole load of resources that are available on my website, including that um, PDASA um, cycle. Um, there's a worksheet that goes with it that's from the um, IHI Institute. Uh, these slides as well as the storyboards um, in a bit bigger format so that you can um, see the detail of how the process works a little bit in the increments that we've discussed here. Um, as well as some examples about other organisation storyboards as well so you can see what sort of things that they did that is just core business for the nurses when you're working on the floor. Nicole, thank you very much for an extremely interesting presentation. Thanks, Sue. Yeah, yeah, I am. Yeah, sorry. I <laughs> yeah, that's went. Right. You went away for a little while, but now I you're did. Back. I disconnected for a second. Yes, yeah. Accreditation is something that sounds like it's incredibly tedious, but actually, what we do every single day. True. And that's it. It's just being able to consistently do it every single day. Yeah. So if you're attending this webinar live and you would like to ask a question of Nicole, um, click on the icon that looks like a question mark and that should bring up a little question box for you and you can type your question in there and hit send. Nicole, the, one of the, um, and as you rightfully say, the, the examples that you were providing are, are things that nurses, you know, nurses do do every day. It's just that we're not used to um, blowing our own trumpet or identifying yeah. those things to others. The concept of the storyboard for people to become engaged, mm. how, how do you do that? How do you create that? Um, I think one of the, the tricks about the storyboards is that it is a pictorial um, way of presenting material. Um, and it is so engaging if you do it right um, that you can see how incredibly powerful it would be with the amount of infographics that circulate through social media. Um, and it's the exact same sort of concept. You're just giving the soundbite information um, in a large poster in those four ways. This is the problem that we observed. This is what we planned to do. This is what we, how we address the problem. This is what the study revealed. And when we went back, we acted by driving that cycle. So it's really chunking those four information in something that looks visually appealing. Um, the mistake that a lot of people use, which there's an example on um, that on the website that's up at the moment, of the, the storyboard is presented that's a 30-page document that is now on tiny, tiny font on a very large board of paper. And I think that probably defeats the purpose because it's just sensory overload. Really, it's just a simple way of giving the really core pieces of information where someone can walk and go, oh, it's a problem with infection. Okay, so this was your um, rate and then you did X, Y and Z and now it's that rate and happy days. It doesn't have to have all of the nuance of information that, um, you know, that you've, it's hard not to tell the whole story but if you want to drive that engagement, it is the sound bites, the core nuggets of this is what we discovered, we fixed it this way, how good is that? And I think that's a great prompt for staff as well because um, my experience is the accreditation coordinator comes around with, you know, a box of chocolates and 27 manuals that yeah. she'd like you to read by 5 o'clock that afternoon mm. and everyone just goes, <laughs> yeah, sure, that, leave the chocolate and you go away. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas if you've got the poster, then when the accreditor like comes into the unit, you're not having to remember 27 manuals. You're just having to go, yeah, that's what we yeah. did. Yeah. And nurses know the story, you know, they, particularly those that have been around for the ward for long, those, those stories live in the corporate memory when all of a sudden um, there was an explosion in the, in the infection rates and they know the story about how actually it was, which is a real story, that was something that I was involved in and the, the infections were high and then as you drill down and drill down and drill down further in this quality cycle, we did discover a problem with the way in which the CSD was processing it. And mm -hmm. so then the, all of the nurses knew that, but that trigger that we have in ourselves, which you alluded to before, that we don't like to self-promote, 
means that when the surveyors come, it was like, well, what have you done with infection control? And the, the impulse is to say, oh, you know, oh, we just... Have any we're just no, we're just here delivering care. You know, we're, we do that. But that is actually how you deliver it and deliver it greatly. Mm -hmm. And you should be able to go, how good is it that we just kept going and discovered this diabolical anomaly? Exactly right. And it's not about, um, and that's what I was alluding to then, it's not about um, not having stuff to show. Like the quality cycle is about continuous improvement and in any large organisation, or large or small really, but the bigger the organisation, the more complexity, the more personality is involved, mm. you always, there is always something. It's about a group of clinical people looking at what's happening and working out, one, if there's a problem and how we can make it better. Yes. If your creditors don't, like if you say, oh, we're, we're great and we, we don't have any problems with information management or you know, entry, exit, infection control, whatever, they go, I'm sure you don't. Yeah. No, exactly. In the exact same way that if the ATO knocked on your door and said, are you paying all your taxes? And you'd go, yeah, absolutely. Nothing to see here. Oh, but yeah. it's their yeah. responsibility yeah. to check up on that because they, the Australian government have a have responsibility to the people of this country to make sure that the hospitals are doing the right thing. So, but, and, but they're just, their function is to do a benchmarking exercise. And when there is a major risk, they have that flexibility um, and authority to refer to the state health department for um, addressing it. But for the most part, they're there to say, is this what you expect and can you do better? Are you exceeding the expectations? Are you not? Um, and it's incredibly, it definitely is a very strong motivator for hospitals to really make sure that they've closed their gaps. Um, and without that, I think there would be a lot of hospitals sitting out there with some fairly poor processes and for poor care delivery with no real motivation to fix it. No. And certainly accreditation is also a time for you know, the clinical nursing team to, to basically be able to identify professionally what they do to achieve yeah. the best possible, you know, outcome for the clients in their care. Absolutely. It's a great, nurses are incredibly excited by best practice um, and being able to implement that, but often feel like there's no avenue for them to um, deliver that best practice because, you know, there's no money and there's no offline time and there's no time. This is the vehicle for that. If you sell it to the organisation, this is a real pain point for the organisation because if they don't meet accreditation, then it's excruciating. It has major, major impacts for the organisation or the business. So this is an opportunity for a nurse to exploit that pain point and say this best practice is a great quality improvement and you just dress it up in that plan, do, act the check act cycles so that you can deliver best practice. There are enormous opportunities for nurses to do incredible things that they've discovered out of research and what would really benefit their patient under this framework. And a fabulous framework you have presented to us today. Thank you. So yeah, thank you, Nicole. It was it was a really great presentation, and I do um, recommend you visit Nicole's website and have a look at the other resources she also has available there. Lovely. To every to everyone who's listening, I wish you an absolutely exceptional day, and I look forward to seeing you online at another webinar very soon. Goodbye. <laughs>